Thank you for joining me today, John. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. So you took charge of data science at Ticketmaster about three years ago now. Talk a little bit about your initial strategy at analyzing the user and sales data and how has it evolved over the past few years? When I came there, I don't think Ticketmaster had a good concept of what data science was or how it could be used for the business. So uh, the, the initial um, uh, target was a, a real set of concrete tasks, a small set of concrete tasks that we can go and execute that we knew that if we used you know, a little bit of intuition, a little bit of science, and the massive data assets that we had at Ticketmaster, we can go and answer some of these, you know, um, nagging problems, right? Some of them being, you know, there's a large portion of tickets that don't get sold in an event. How, how do you go and find those people, and how do you engage with them, and how do you market to them? How do you bring them to those events? To, you know, how do you stop abuse on Ticketmaster, right? So, so it's real, real, real concrete problems. What we've evolved to, I think, is a more general approach of we still want those concrete things, but we want to build a, a bed of, of data science assets that's built on top of you know, a company that's been around almost 40 years and has a lot of data, data assets. How do we build the platform that will really leverage those things into the future beyond just those small niche products that we really want to build? Yeah. And so it's more of a holistic kind of approach. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's and it's trying to also bridge the gap between a lot of those products too, right? So, so rather than think of each of those things as a, as a vertical or a silo that's trying to accomplish something, it's how do you use something that you built over here, you know, over here to, to make that better, right? mm -hmm. And in an interview at the time that you took the job, you said that using a website wouldn't be the be-all, end-all of a way for people to purchase tickets and that you would be investigating new avenues. So over the last few years, what avenues of engagement are you, are you finding? It's funny, when, when, I, when I said that quote, I was, I was obviously just talking about mobile, right? That uh, we knew that we wanted a way to, um, of, of allow people to purchase tickets through whatever mobile platform or whatever platform they really wanted to. You know, there's constraints with those platforms that, that don't exist in the web, right? With the web, you can say, you can have, you know, you know these events over here, these events over here, these events over here. You can kind of give them a catalog to show, right? But, you know, catalogs don't work very well in a mobile environment. So, you know, how do you really give them recommend to them, tell them what events are in their area when you only have a, you know, a small opportunity in which, to, in which to give them the information. But it's funny that I don't think it's necessarily just mobile anymore, right? The, the real channel that we really want to tap into for, for getting our fans to um, attend more events, right, is, is how do we leverage um, people? Right? How do we get other people to market for us? Right? We're in this business, and, and I use this quote all the time, is, is um, it's one thing to be in a commerce industry where you're selling something that, that's very profitable, that has a good margin, that has uh, a lot of upside to it, right? But it's interesting to be in the live event space where people are really passionate about it, right? I mean, you can sell shoes, you can sell clocks, you can sell you know, phones, but nobody's gonna be at a stage screaming and yelling for phones, right? They're not gonna do that, right? We're in that business where people care that much about what they're purchasing, that they you know, scream and cry about it, right? So how do we use that passion to get people to market these events for us, right? If it's one thing people want, it, when they attend an event, most of the time, they want their friends, they want people, they want people to attend that event with them. It makes them feel part of that social event. Um, and they want to market it for us. So uh, I think beyond mobile channels, it's, it's people. Right? It's getting people to help uh, get more people to attend more events and sell more tickets. And that's interesting. Can you give an example of, of a success in that area? Um, it's, it's, it's all over the place. I mean, it's... But, Right now, we're not doing anything to help it, right? If somebody puts a, um, if, if a artist on Facebook, right, puts out something that says, hey, I have an event coming up, right? And, they, and everybody who's friends with that artist flock over to that event and go over there and, and friend that event and start posting pictures of that event, right? In the background, Ticketmaster is helping that because we're providing the data that allows 
ticket or allows Facebook to show those events, to show, hey, this is what we have, and to make sure it's up to date, and make sure all everything's accurate, right? We do that, but that's just a really small piece of the pie, right? We we want to get it beyond. Um, you know, beyond one channel, beyond one group of people, and how do we really put the power in the in the individuals to market these events? Right. So personalized marketing is playing a big role. It always does, right? I mean, I, I think that's a that's a given in this space. I mean, uh, coming from from the ad systems, you know, the better you match the content to the user, the the, the better conversion you're going to get, right? But but in the case of live events and and the, and what we're trying to provide. Um, uh, it, it's 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 less about just finding something that they're going to click on and like and perhaps buy. It's it's what are they really passionate about, and then based on what they're really passionate about, what other things might they be interested in as well? And what are you finding any obstacles in personalized marketing, like maybe on the privacy side or security side, stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, there's always those barriers, right? I mean, you you, you have to be careful, right, and about how how often you send messages to people, what kind of message you send to people. Um, you know, you, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to spam somebody with an email every day, right? I mean, I think that's kind of obvious, right? But it's more about the progression and um, journey that somebody's along, right? If you can find the right time in which to tell them about something or the right time in which to remind them about something and be really part of that whole event process from the time that the tickets first go on sale to the time that they attend event, really be part of that process with them. And message to them saying, hey, you know, your event's coming up, you know, do you want to know where the best parking is? You know, it's, it's, it's that level of engagement that we're looking at. And that all is very personalized, right? It has to be very personalized. So building um, algorithms, data models, um, you know, the, the whole slew of, of um, data availability that we can provide, that pipeline, uh, can only help people, I, I don't know, like Ticketmaster more? Yeah, that's, that's really my goal. That's interesting. So another thing that you said in that early interview was that you knew the value of an impression for an advertiser, but you didn't know the value of a seat for a user. So what kinds of things are you learning in your journey to explore that question? Um, I guess the first thing that I learned was um, the ad world does a pretty good job optimizing price to value, right? Because you have enough bidders, you have enough offers that, that you can match those things pretty well and people can optimize that based on what they, what they can spend and what they can't, right? It works out pretty well that way. With the live event marketplace, it's, it's really not that simple. Um, the pricing around live events and what what I think the value of that seat is that I want to sit at is very different than what the artist might think or what the venue might think or what anybody else along that chain might think. Um, and it really comes down to that, that, same, that same fan passion that people have. You know, the, the artist wants to make sure that those seats are available and that they are priced within the means of their fans. They're trying to do what's best for their fans and really price it that way, right? But to many fans, it might be worth a lot more than that, right? It's really hard to, to bridge that gap. So what you have is, that's why you have such inefficiency in the marketplace with, with events, right? You have, um, you have uh, tickets that go on sale at Ticketmaster for, I don't know, $50? and then end up showing up at secondary markets for $2,000, $3,000, right? It's really hard to manage that. So I think where, I think what I've learned is where ads, I think it's pretty easy to deterministically figure out what the value of that thing is. It's really hard with seats. I mean, it's, it's really hard to understand that other than, because you can't really just look at price. You have to look at everything else around what that value of that seat is. What's the level of engagement the fan has? You know, how often do they revisit that artist? It's, it's all those things that are the more intrinsic value of those seats. And so right before the holidays, you tweeted a photo from a Battle of the Bots hackathon. I think it was in New York. No, it was here. In, oh, it, it was, was here in Hollywood. It was in Hollywood. Uh -huh. um, so you talked a little bit about bots at the very beginning. How big of a problem are bots for Ticketmaster, and what, what's your strategy for dealing with them? 
first of all, I don't like to call them bots because okay. it, it's it's really it's really just about abuse, right? Um, I don't think anybody cares whether somebody is using a you know a script or an application or you know a thousand machines in some cloud somewhere to do an attack, right, or to do something bad. It's really about what they're doing that's bad, and that's what we focus on. We focus on you know, what are the people that are doing that's bad? And then how do we build, how do we use machine learning? How do we use data science? How do we use all those things in which to, in which to stop those people, right? The kinds of things that people do are bad. I, I, I don't think much of that gets as much public attention as it should. But um, if, uh, when you go to an on-sale at Ticketmaster, I'm sure most people have been to an on-sale at Ticketmaster. It's, it's tough, right? I mean, there's, you know, it, there's, you don't know what's going on. You, you, you put in for tickets and you, you cross your fingers and you hope you get these tickets, right? What's really going on behind the scenes with a lot of bad actors, this is the kind of abuse that we see, is, is people will come in and they'll, and they'll um, put in an ask for tickets, right? And if they get those tickets, those tickets will go into a, what we call a reserve state for a short period of time, for 15 minutes or whatever it's, whatever it's configured for. During that time, what, what bad guys will do is they'll, they'll take the fact that they've locked up these tickets and prevented people from buying those tickets. And then they'll post them on secondary markets and wait until they get a nibble. And then once they get a nibble, then they'll purchase those tickets. It's kind of a risk-free arbitrage, right? And then they'll just keep doing that again and again and again. The problem for, for fans is if they're more efficient at getting those tickets in that reserve state than a regular person is, then they're going to lock up all the tickets and it looks to you as a regular fan that, that wow, there's just no tickets available. When the reality is it's people cherry picking these things and doing really bad things to prevent people from buying tickets because they want to be in control of the marketplace. So it's, it, when I say abuse, it's really about I don't want other people to control the marketplace. I want, I want you know, I want capitalism. I want fans. I want, I want everybody to, to, to go in there and get a chance to buy the tickets and kind of level the playing field. So all right, all right. that's the level of abuse. Did anything fun come out of that hackathon? We love hackathons. I mean, that's, that's why I'm in this business, right? I mean, I, I love the idea of, of getting a bunch of my friends, smart people, um, to stay up 24 hours and, and just try to build something cool, right? Try to build something that, that, that we think is valuable. Um, and that last one was great because we, we actually had a uh, shout out to the 714 Tickets Group, which is, a, which is a secondary market group, which is a broker company, right, um, who volunteered. They sent six of their engineers up to spend 24 hours with us and, and do the hackathon with us. It was, it was great. It was, it, was, it was a really good time. That's fun. Yeah. So changing gears uh, quite a lot, you've got a background in genetics, correct? Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that background and how it helps inform your work today in the big data space. Um, my background's in, in population genetics, which uh, I argue that the field of statistics w was actually invented for population genetics, right? So, so it's, it's, uh, it's been around a really long time. My, my first venture um, out of grad school was to work for a small company at the time called GoTo, which eventually became Overture, which created the sponsored search industry. Um, one of the things I initially did when I went over there was take a, uh, a sequence alignment algorithm and apply that to the, to the money-making industry behind search in, in the very early days. I mean, that was, that was, it was fun to do. Um, but I think it's... it's uh, Beyond the statistics, beyond the, you know, what you can get, which, what similarities you can get between population genetics and, and what you call modern data science, um, there's a lot there. But I think the real thing I gained was, was, was scientific discipline, like everybody else. It's, it's the ability to do an experiment. It's, it's the ability to, to keep doing things over and over and over again and then be the person who can recognize when something really magical is happening, right? Because that, that's really, I mean, science you can get from, from libraries, from writing code, et cetera, but, but real data science is an art form. I mean, it's really about recognizing when you see something that, um, that nobody else sees, right? That, that's what really makes a, a good data scientist. It's, it's that art. That's interesting. So to close our conversation today and taking kind of a broad look, I'm interested to know what people and projects you're following, what kinds of things are you finding particularly interesting? This was a, this was a tough question, right? Um, the, and I, I hope it doesn't sound too nerdy, but um, 
The thing that really excites me right now it isn't even in the field of data science, so to speak. It's more in the field of, of data volume. Um, there are things that, that I can do now with making large amounts of available, large amounts of data, whether that's engagement data or transaction data or anything like that, to make it available in almost real time to any number of systems, which, which is just fascinating to me. The, the idea of, of having data being processed from uh, you know, this database to the flat files to this database to ETL and, and really this long laborious process and lots of latency between when the data are created to the data are available to other systems it's just gone. I mean, it's just gone away. And I dream of the day when uh, there are, there's item potency in data along that entire stream that we can have people that are processing data and don't really have to worry about it. They can just send things through and there will be item potency of those data all the way through to the other endpoint. And it, it just makes for a, a perfect ecosystem for somebody like me who just wants access to as much as possible. Cause the more data you have access to, I mean, that's a general theme, I think, here at Strata, is the more data you have access to, you can throw any algorithm at it, it's going to work, right? And so that's the goal, right? If we can set that up, if we can build that ecosystem and make that really commonplace and supported, then, um, then that really levels the playing field. Excellent. Thank you very much for talking with me today. Uh, thank you very much.